Welcome to a new season of Leadership Live podcast, where talented people become extraordinary leaders. I'm Daphna Horowitz, and I'm here to help you cut through the noise and talk about real leadership issues, down-to-earth, solid, caring, and confident leadership. No theory, no pie in the sky, no frills or fluff, because this is what the world needs most right now, for you to lead with confidence, clarity, and impact so that you can build a business that builds people, grows profit, and makes a difference. It's not easy to be a CEO, a wife, a mother of four, and still manage to keep all the balls juggled and flowing. Don't we know it? It takes a lot of courage, self-determination, and focus to drive you and your team through the hard times while keeping a strong focus on your purpose or your why and still deal with the day-to-day tasks and challenges life throws our way. Well, we have a great example here with Ifi Ibekwe. I loved this coaching session with Ifi because she is just dynamite. She's inspiring, dynamic, successful, and continually growing herself as she grows her business. Her passion and drive is infectious. You're in for a treat. Today, we covered the relevant topics of delegation versus micromanagement, staying in your zone of genius, believing in yourself, and managing your team in the most effective and inspiring way. Lots of great nuggets here, so enjoy. And before we dive in, a quick reminder to head on to DaphnaHorovitz.com where there are details about a brand new offer which is aimed at CEOs who've been in role for under two years. So if that's you and you would like to find out more about how to increase your leadership, effectiveness and impact, head on to DaphnaHorovitz.com to find out more details. Welcome to Leadership Live podcast and today I'm really excited to host Ifi Ibekwe on our po- podcast and we are going to have a live coaching session. So welcome Ifi. Thank you so much Daphne. I'm so excited to be here. Me too. So Ifi, let's just dive right in and maybe tell us what, what is the topic that you're bringing to our coaching conversation today? I'm going to talk about the ins and outs of team management and how to lead a, a, a small team, but the challenges and opportunities that come from that. So hopefully we can dive in and, and see what, yeah. what happens. Yeah. So maybe a little bit in the way of introduction, Ify, I know you're a mom to four kids. Is that right? Yes. How old yes. are they? My oldest is seven right now, and he uh, he's in first grade. And then I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a 10-month-old. Wow. And they're Incredible. all very spirited children. So <laughs> I think I may have one introvert in there. Amazing. Amazing. And together with that, you're running your business. You're a leader in your business. And you'll tell us a little bit about that. And yes. in these times, to have all of that running together is, is not a small accomplishment. So, so tell us about your business. What is it that you do? I am an estate planning attorney, which in English means that I'm the type of attorney that just um, that writes wills and trusts and other healthcare directives and um, helps people protect their assets and themselves. Um, and I have an office in Austin, Texas, where I manage four people, and um, and it, I've been around almost three full years now in business, and I've grown to a, a team of five, and it has been amazing. But one of the things that lawyers will often tell you is that they don't teach us how to be business people. At mm-hmm. least in my law, um, my law school was very academic and, you know, the elite positions were becoming a judge or becoming a, um, a you could become a law clerk, you could become a law professor. Those are tiny percentage of lawyers who do that. Or you could go to a really big firm and become a partner. And then for the majority of us, goodbye and good luck. You know? And my, my path um, wasn't that, but I ended up after 11 years of practice in one area, opening up my 
own practice on my own um, for the last three years, like I've mentioned. So yeah, it's yeah. been it's been an amazing journey into entrepreneurship and leadership. So congratulations on that. And I do want to just pick up on one point that you said about going to law school, learning how to be a lawyer with certain aspirations or career paths that come with that. But nowhere did anybody teach or learn about how to be in business. And Not at to, all. Yeah, I have to say I can totally relate to that because I see that as one of the mindset shifts that I had to make at some point because I also grew up in a family in a context where you went to university, you learned your profession. So I am, my previous profession is an actuary. So I learned how to be an oh. actuary and I was going to go into the corporate environment and work my way up and earn a fantastic salary. And that right. was my mindset. Never did I grow up with an entrepreneurial mindset of thinking one day I'll be in business, one day I'll be leading a team, one day I'll be... It's a complete mindset shift. So, and I think it's a big step, a big leap to make it. Absolutely. And I think it's so analogous to a lot of professions, especially the quote unquote traditional ones, whether you're a teacher or a doctor and you decide to deviate from your path yeah. or do it just a little bit differently. It's almost, or leave, you know, um, yeah. fully and start something else. It's just always... I think that by the time my kids are older, this won't be a conversation as much as it is now. Sure. And maybe 10 years ago, it was even more, what? You know, but it's just, it's fascinating because I'm seeing so many people yes. do different things with their quote unquote traditional degrees. And it's phenomenal. It and, is. And, yeah. and it, it's creative. So. Exactly. I'm and this it. is where stepping into leadership really comes into play. So what I am also noticing in terms of my own work is that whether I'm coaching a leader in a big corporate environment or a professional who is really good at what they do and they now want to open their own business, there's a step into leadership that happens there. Yes. And for me, the distinct step is when you're so good at what you do that you get either promoted into a level of leadership where now you're leading a team and have to see results through them and you're creating a business or you actually leave that corporate environment. and create. So you're either creating a business within the corporate environment or you're creating a business for yourself because you say, I want to do something different. I want to create my own environment and I'm going to do it myself. And that's, again, stepping into that leadership, which is a very different mindset and a different place to be at. A different skill set. Yeah. It's completely different, but it's true. Many people build businesses under the umbrella of another person's business. And so when you yeah. have the um, ability or courage or, or circumstance desire. Yeah. or desire, I just want to give all the <laughs> ways that this can happen. It's amazing. It, mm -hmm. it does. It, it's very analogous and it does open up a whole host of um a whole host of opportunities and fears and mindset shifts that need to take place in order to sustain that without, you know, the umbrella of a corporate structure. So what example. has been the biggest kind of leap or mindset shift for you in this transition? Yeah, I think that I was terrified to hire the first person to help okay. me. I definitely never would have thought that in two, oh my gosh, what is it, January now, in almost three years that I would have a staff meeting with all these people just <laughs> attending. What and, was terrifying about it? What was oh, the most terrifying thing about it? What if I don't make enough money to pay them? Yeah. That was the number one. And so I'll wind so it all the way back. Responsibility yeah. for other people's livelihoods. Yes. And so I didn't actually hire my first employee until... Um, 2019. And, and that was a virtual assistant. And it's just because people told you, you should hire a virtual assistant first. And I am till today, we're still great friends, but I think I hired the wrong position. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, just being terrified that I would not make enough money to be able to pay the employee was 
I mean, it would just yeah, petrify me. Because you're yeah. needing to earn enough to keep your business running, to keep you running, and now you're taking you're taking on responsibility, commitment for more people. Yes. What, so, what helped you to do that? Just doing it. Just doing it. Courage. Letting it be motivating that I need to pay her. So I need to go find that business. Okay. And I need to come through and follow through and perform. Um, and then I also collect my fees up front, you know, um, so it wouldn't be a, a, a cash flow issue if I, I didn't at first for my very first client. And then I said, nope, I'm going to flat fee everything and collect it up front and not tell people that, oh, and I can give you a discount if you pay up front or yeah. I can break it into two because I'm just so desperate for business. <laughs> you know, you know, when you start, you're just like, will anybody believe that I'm real? Um, and so that was one of the things that really helped cash flow is, you know, I held it in my trust account and then I would pay her as it, it's earned because lawyers have very specific rules about how to take money um, a client's money. And so those are the things that I started doing and just keeping it in there, knowing that no matter what I could pay her and I could pay myself. I mean, I barely was paying myself, but yeah. that help opened up so many doors because she took on so much work that was taking the time away from finding business for me. You know, um, I was doing so many administrative tasks that I wasn't doing any lawyer yeah, so I'm actually Ask. hearing three things in this leap that you took in terms of hiring your first uh, staff member. One is the confidence and the courage to actually just do it. Mm -hmm. uh, second is the leverage that's created. So you've hired a staff member, now you have leverage to spend time doing the things that you need to be focusing yes. on. And the third thing I'm hearing is that it almost uh, forced you or got you to take some courageous moves in terms of how you run your business because you knew you had to bring that income in. So yes. whether it was restructuring the way that you set your fees or chasing clients in a certain way or almost going from that, I'll do anything to hold on a sec, this is a business now. And it right. changed your thinking in terms of, okay, I have to run it like a business and I have to think like a business and I have to bring an income like a business. And that shifts how you do things as well. Absolutely, yes. So if yes. we go to the topic that you brought forward around challenges of leading a team, and I suppose also in this environment and that, you know, remote team, yes, yes. What, what is one challenge that's on your mind at the moment that you'd like to explore maybe a little bit more deeply? Yeah, and um, I think that, you know, I have a wonderful team, and they are just a, a delightful group of uh, women, all women right now. Yay, um, one of the things that is challenging is, is keeping up with everyone can be a challenge to so make sure that everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. Um, I will explain that I have um, someone who works for the operations side of it who has recently taken a lot of that off my plate. Nice. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a separation from everyone's day-to-day -day tasks. And so another thing that comes with that, which is an amazing time freer and blessing to be able to be on podcasts like this and, um, you know, spend the time doing that instead of managing people or, or working on, a, you know, administrative task or whatever else we do that we convince ourselves we should be doing. But it, it leads me in that part of my mind where I'm like, don't micromanage. It's not, it, you don't uh -huh. want to do that. You know, you don't have to check in on that. You know, you've hired somebody to do that. It's okay. You're not where you started. And so those are the sorts of things mm -hmm. that come up is, you know, just even as you grow and expand your business, how do you keep your foot on the ground so that you're not so, and I'm a very visionary futurist type, so I can very much be pie in the sky, but how do you keep a connection, especially since you still have pretty much a core team, it might change in another year and yeah. where this will be a ridiculous question, but how do you keep that interaction where they know that you know, I do care about what you're doing and you may not be in the day-to-day -day tasks, but generally 
you are still in touch with the team if that yeah. makes sense <laughs> makes perfect sense and definitely a challenge that i think many leaders and managers face and if we can just kind of sharpen the the question a little bit even make it a bit tighter it's really talking about how do i maintain the balance between knowing what's going on in my business and uh, letting go enough, trusting my team enough to run yes. with it. Perfect. And then there, it's kind of there's that continuum between delegation to abdication, where <laughs> delegation is letting people get on with it, giving them authority and autonomy, trusting them to do their thing, and still knowing what's going on versus, okay, I've handed it over, make sure it's done, and I'm not even hearing you and I think that there's a big fear for managers who are sitting in that space of trying to navigate the correct balance because there's a part of you that feels like if I let go then I'm not going to know what's going on or the other side of that is if I let go then I have to totally let go and then of course, mistakes are made and things aren't done exactly as you want. And then you go, okay, I shouldn't have let go. This is why I can't that. let go. Yes, this is yeah. why I can't let go. <laughs> Ever. Yes, exactly And then you that. just dive right back into the micromanagement. And there's a lot of that balance of surrender and control. Surrender and yes. control. Mm. And there are tasks also that I enjoyed doing. I love marketing. I love that part of the practice, but I no longer have to do it. I don't have to design yes. things, but I do enjoy it. And yes. so sometimes and I'll find myself in there and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I just had to do it. And so even that, um, letting go of that, you know, I love how you say there is a delegation versus abdication. It definitely has the crown vibes. It reminds me, I don't know if you've seen the crown on no, Netflix. <laughs> And one series um, is about, you know, the British royal family yeah. and how one of the royals abdicated his throne for his lover. Um, and so, yeah, when you said that, it made me laugh. But yes, that that is true. There are things to abdicate because they are inconsequential. They just need to be done. Yeah. And then there are things to delegate. And I, I definitely lean towards the delegation side. Yeah. I think the challenge is when I... I, I, when will I feel comfortable that I know enough, you yeah, know, I, and I've, yeah. And I know a lot of people say, nobody will love your business like you do. And it's all, I, I don't know that that is a hundred percent true, but it's certainly one of the things that as a leader who, a founder, not just someone placed as the leader, it does weigh heavily on you that, yeah. you know, everyone can leave and, you would still have to be the one here, you know, because it's what you've built. And so, yeah, th yeah. those are some of the things too that come up. So I used to work with a, with a client actually in the um, IT space who used to say, I am the only one in the business who doesn't sleep at night because I'm worried oh. about the business. <laughs> And, and I do sometimes wonder if that's part of the story that we tell ourselves. So I think there's a lot of moving parts here. And you, you also mentioned loving sometimes getting into the weeds. And I know that another client that I'm working with at the moment, who's an actuary, talks about the fact that he misses, he's a CEO, founder of a startup, and he misses getting into the actual work. Because when you make that transition into leader, founder, CEO, manager, you have to move away a little bit from the stuff that you really know how to do well, the stuff that got you to this leadership yes. position. And, and you might miss that because that's the known. That's, that gives you the warm and, warm and fuzzies, you know, from a, in, an, in actuarial language when you solve a problem or when you exactly. model it in a way. It like gives you that hit of dopamine that is irreplaceable. It's and, so fun. Mm, it's fun. So there's that. There's the element of, you know, can I really trust my team to take on the same level of ownership 
mm-hmm. as I would because this is my business and it's my baby. You know, would yeah. I be able to trust my team and really know that they're running it well? And then there's a part of you that really just wants to know what's going on. You want to know what's going on. You want your people to come to you with problems, with what's happening. You want to be kept in the know, but not to the level of micromanagement where they can't move if you haven't given them yes. okay or told them how to do it. Yeah, or they can't. Yeah, and that's that really, you know, I don't consider myself a micromanager on purpose, <laughs> but I, I see where I step on toes when. And it also, it, it seems like it could demoralize right? There's part of it that I will be part of, for example, the drafting of various trusts documents or estate planning documents that they will come to me for the um, knowledge and, you know, strategy in doing that. And of course, that's something that keeps me rooted in their day-to-day work, right? For things that come up that are deviations from the norm or things they haven't seen before, or question they haven't received, because there's always a new question or a new family structure or a new way to manage assets. But then there are other things that I'm afraid that if I, I do micromanage that, just because I enjoy it, you know, and I haven't found an, an equal outlet <laughs> for design, maybe take an art class, which is something I'm doing this weekend, um, then it kind of... Um, undermines their ability to take ownership and make mistakes and correct them because I can get in and I can just do it, you know, and I have to start saying, stop, that is not my role. I have to let them be able to make that mistake or not do it the way that I want and then explain it because that's more teachable than, Mm -hmm. oh, but don't worry, I just got in there and fixed it. And I'm really struggling with that especially for the things I like to do. So let's let's look at that a little bit more because what is behind that? What is underneath that? If you think about it, okay, you can dive in because you really love to do the stuff or or you could go for an art class and leave your your staff to do it. So what what is the fear, the nervousness, the what what is lying underneath that? Yeah, control. <laughs> I, okay. Like mass it's my image, right? It's my that that possessiveness, I guess that's the word and control. Just of the smallest detail that nobody probably notices. So what are you afraid will happen if those mistakes if you if you did let go? And someone missed those details, someone stuffed up, someone made a mess. I mean, there's nothing would happen, you know, even if it's like a logical man saying nothing will happen, you know, nothing will happen because it's fixable. And that's our rational brain. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's a good catch. Uh, (laughs) I was going to BS you in that area. Um, Yeah, no BS. (laughs) You're like, no, no, that's not good enough. Um, Yes, you're right. (laughs) What is my fear of letting something like that? Go. Like if something happened and it was a mistake, I, I don't know. I think that it, if I could be honest about it, I, I feel like it would affect my reputation, okay. my reputation for excellence. Um, and I and I think that's so much of what it is is that it would it would look bad on me not on anybody else, but on me. Mm. And I have and worked. And if you looked bad, what would actually, what does that bring up for you? Again, on it, a fear level. On a fear level, it makes me um, fear not being taken seriously. Um, it makes me fear um, that my credibility will be diminished amongst my peers it makes me feel like I won't be taken seriously by my clients. And when I say peers, I mean, you know, other lawyers who I am assuming are seeing the mistake or whatever Mm. (laughs) flaw this is. And the clients won't hire me and that, um, and that the business will fail ultimately. Mm. I guess that's, that would be the bottom out, right? You make a 
big enough mistake that you are now out of business. So even small, you know, snowball effect becomes this huge avalanche. Um, And so the control and um, the micromanaging of even silly little tasks ultimately are protect your business from this massive failure and reputation risk and credibility it sounds so crazy but when you drill down yes that is okay what sounds crazy to you about that what's the crazy part tell me because you know when you talk about your rational brain is like i will correct it and we will fix it or we will delete it or we will make amends right? right in reality that's what if you told me what I just told you, I, I'd be like, yeah, that is fantastical thinking to think yeah, that. That's ridiculous. You know, <laughs> one, one typo or the tense being, you know, wrong or a misspelling of someone's name will lead to your business shutting down. I'd say, yeah, you know, there are so many steps in between that for mitigating factors. But when you flip the script and ask me to tell you, it does sound like, I just immediately skip to the end result being the worst. Because you've taken it straight to survival. Actually, Mm -hmm. that tiny little typo in the one report is now immediately linked to your survival and your business survival and your actual being on this. It's on a, on a, on a, what's it, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like internal deep level of I need to survive. Yes. Yeah, and that is scary. It is. It is scary. Thankfully, it doesn't keep me up at night anymore. But those are the sorts of things that I, I fear is where have I made a mistake? Yeah. So let me As ask you a this. person. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just thinking about in the context. Like I'm like, oh, also in my for my children too. <laughs> it just can spiral. Yeah. But that's a whole other conversation. So where did you yeah. just? Take it. Tell me. Oh, I said, um, and I was thinking like, oh, you know, where have I made a mistake also in in my parenting, right? I mean, I could go down this rabbit hole, but I'm actually capturing that thought and not going there because I think that there could be a shame spiral that's Mm -hmm. also associated, you know, where there's actually nothing that comes to mind, but it's like, oh, but what if there is something? And it's just like, sometimes I just stop it and say, no, I'm not going to entertain that. Um, But that's a great catch, Ify, because mm -hmm. what you're actually saying is that this is a pattern that for you can show up in many different ways. When you are taking a small mistake and making it all about your survival, so whether it's the business survival or the the mother survival or the children survival, there's something that immediately takes you to that place. With the children, with the parenting, you could catch it immediately and say, no, I'm not going there. And that's really fantastic. How can you catch it in your business and go, I'm not going there? Because you said your rational brain, when you're looking at this, your rational brain is saying to you, that's ridiculous. A typo isn't going to bring your whole business down crashing and burning. Right. How do you catch that? I think in the same way as recognize it for what it is, that accusation, the accusing voice and seeing it replicate, whether it's in my business or in my parenting or in my marriage. You know, I think the reason I can catch it so much for motherhood is because I know I don't believe that I'm a bad mother. (laughs) You know, I know that I am a great mother. And so anything that kind of lines up against that is and I don't say that in a way that I'm just, you know, I am beyond reproach. I say that in a way that I have tangible examples of. Exactly. Hold on. You my, are owning your yes. ability and your ability to stand in your power as a good mother. Of course, exactly. we're going to make mistakes, but we yes, believe, exactly. you believe you're a good mother. Fundamentally. I take that um, framework, that paradigm and apply it to your business. Is there something yes. about your business that you don't have that same level of knowledge of I am? Absolutely. Okay, tell me. <laughs> and so to the beginning of this conversation, we talk about I'm not trained, you know, I don't have the experience. Motherhood, I feel like I do have experience. Ex- 
Did you get well, a certificate I feel like... anyway? I'm a good mother. Look, I've got a I've got a motherhood certificate from Yale University. I'll right? tell you how it works for me for motherhood. Having those babies up leveled my confidence in ways that honestly I don't think I would have. Uh, pushing out a baby, honestly, is I, I don't care how your baby comes out, but for me. It really up leveled what I could do. I'm like, if I can carry this person in my stomach and birth them, I really can raise them. You know, I feel so like if I'm going to stop you there and for exactly, it's the same. You birthed this business. You grew up in an environment that said you will become a judge or a partner in a great firm or a this or a that, and you went and birthed a business. You did it a different way. You you dealt that with is struggles so, and the, oh, it's so true. Yes. And you're leading a team of four people now. Yes, that's you very are there. true. You have yes. birthed this. And I think that I do need to stand in the power of that and look at it the same way. I have not raised a teenager, right? I have, right. <laughs> or tween, or whatever they call them when they you're are almost there. a teenager. Like, no. <laughs> But it's just the same thing. It really is hearing that accusatory, well, you're not trained. You don't have an MBA. Who are you to? You don't have managerial experience. Yes, I do. I do actually, <laughs> you know, I have managerial experience. I may not have a master's in business, but I do have on the job skills. And, and I, I want to just jump in there because a master's in business does not True. mean that you're a good manager. You know, Absolutely. That's why I've got so much work. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Lots of masters in business, not always good managers. Yes, absolutely. But we tell ourselves the stories that the only people who can do, and it's the same I've heard from people who don't have their uh, degree from university or they didn't finish high school, but they're succeeding, right, in whatever they're doing, but they still have that, oh, but I'm not credentialed enough, right? Yeah. Um and I said I wouldn't talk about imposter syndrome, but it's all it's all that mindset exactly. of not being worthy of being in that position right. or deserving exactly. the things that are happening. And I think to go back to your question, how do I catch it? I think when I hear it, I catch it just like I would as, exactly. as in the motherhood example, because I know what that is. That voice sounds like. Yeah, you know what that voice sounds like, so you can catch it. But for me, what I heard very strongly is you've got that very strong belief, I'm a good mother. What yes, is the analogous yes. belief for your business? I'm a good... I'm a good businesswoman. I'm okay. a good business owner. I'm a good employer. How does that um, fit for you when you say that? I'm a good businesswoman. I'm a good employer. I'm a good manager. Actually, I have metrics. You're an actuary, so you look <laughs> at numbers. And I, I mean, I hear it okay. and I hear it from my CPA, like somebody who is truly, you know, looking at the growth so I can use that to back that up. You awesome. know, sometimes you need data. Sometimes it's great to think stuff, but it's wonderful to also look at and see your data okay. and it's like, and have the metrics you're trying to, and have the number of clientele that I've had come through and purchase my services and have people say, I, I was referred to you. So I'm just going to book you because this awesome. person, tr these are all things that support that. Um, that's the data. That's the that data. data. There's a deeper knowledge. There's a deeper knowledge or something that you need to remember or remind yourself That's of. That's true. What is it? I just love it. I mean, I love entrepreneurship. I, I cannot see myself applying for a job. I love building this. And um, yesterday I was telling my husband, I, I had a bakery. <laughs> In 2014, I opened wow. up a bake. I think it was, no, 2011, I opened up a bakery. It's a home bakery in Austin. And it got so popular that I closed it. Wow. Because I could not be a lawyer and then up until the wee hours of the morning baking. And you can even Google it. My website still, it's called Iffy's Sweets and Treats. Huh? And I would make Amazing. cake balls and French macarons and little animals made out of cake. And I would meticulously like coat them and make chicks and pigs and sheep 
it was ridiculous and it was time consuming. That is incredible. But I saw that, you know, I'm doing weddings and retirements and graduation parties and I'm doing birthday parties every single weekend and I'm packaging and, you know, I had a business and I think that was my first bug wow. where I was like, I could have really made I yeah I've done it but it, even then I was like it's just a hobby that went out of control <laughs> people will still be asking me can you do mother's day cake balls for 800 you know I'm like no I don't do that anymore I don't know why I ever wow. did that the way I did but it was the entree into that bug you're just like oh you can make money doing this and um and not that money was the driver but it was the idea that I can support I can make work happen mm -hmm. to support my family. And that to me is very empowering. And I love that feeling. Mm -hmm. And so innately, if I, if, if I wake up in the middle of the night, I'll have a thought or if I want to read a book, it's going to be about this. It's in my passion area. I am good at it. I know I'm good at it. You know, so that's why those thoughts, when they pop up, they don't even line up with my inner desire. Like, I want to do this. I'm not doing this because I have to. Um, and if I didn't do law, if I wasn't a business person who practiced law, I would be doing some other business. I, I know that. And so it's just what I enjoy. Fantastic. This is so you are saying, actually, not there isn't an I want to be here. There's I am just like yes. with your mother, with your being a mother. It's not I want to be a mother. It's I am a mother and I'm a good mother. It's the same thing here. There isn't I want to be a businesswoman. Yeah. I know I'm a businesswoman and I'm good at it and I yeah. love it and I can do this. Yes. So going back to that micromanagement need to control versus the reputational risk and the worry of all of that. How do you put it all together now with this maybe new paradigm? Right. I, I trust myself. I have hired people who are competent and passionate and bold and honest and all of my um, business values, right, in the hiring process. And they are equipped to do the job at, for which I've hired them. And if they make mistakes, we will correct them. If they, if they decide they no longer to want to work there, there is somebody else who will come in and do that. And that's how the business will continue to grow. And so the idea of micromanaging that is, is, is a taking away from all that I've already established for the business mm -hmm. and for their professional growth, you know. And, it's and actually it's, counterproductive because if your yeah. aim is to create this business that is delivering excellence and value and has a high reputation... Yeah. By micromanaging, you are being counterproductive. Yes. Because when you're hiring people, you're hiring them for excellence, reputation, quality yeah. of delivery, and all I, the things that are important to you. And I'm taking away, I'm taking away that space that you just like you said, that I have hired to ex for that expansion, right? It's a contracting Right. action when I micromanage or worry over how I would have done it because yes I can do everything I feel like I can do everything in the business because I used to yes. <laughs> but I don't have to and so, so letting I love that go the, yeah I love the distinction you made there the, the micromanaging is a contracting mm -hmm. activity whereas the trust and the leveraging and the hiring for excellence is an expansion activity Yes. And what you are wanting to do here is an expansion activity because you yes. are building and growing a business. Yes, yes. So that that's what I would that would that's how I would answer that and just really just sitting in that and, and when those things come up and of course they do, thinking why? Why do I feel the need to contract in this area? You know? Um, you, you always hear examples of someone like Oprah or Bill Gates. They're not, they're not working the gates at their, their empire, wherever they are, right? They have someone who does that. They're not pulling the car up. They can drive, I'm sure, but they don't have to. And so part of that growth means that these tasks that, yes, I'm sure they can do many of these things that they no longer do, 
Um, and I use people who are, you know, <laughs> billionaires, um, not what because, I, yeah, I don't know that I've been, I, I hope my great grandchildren get all the, re, reap all of the benefits of that um, in a trust so they, they don't ruin their lives. But, um, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> and I would set it up in that way too, because I'm like, and you just don't leave them the cash outright. Listen, um, I think about that, how they are able to expand. They're regular people, but they have been able to expand because they have had to abdicate, abdicate so much. Yeah. They cannot actually manage the day-to-day of their businesses. Okay. They cannot. Yeah. And so there is a level where abdication is absolutely a must. And then delegation had to have happened along the way to get exactly. to where they are. So. Exactly had to and on that continuum it's like between holding everything or abdicating everything i think there is a situation that requires a level of anything on that continuum there are the things that you want to hold on to there are the things that you need to delegate powerfully and there are the things that you do need to abdicate just let go do not do do not touch yes Um, yes and actually, I, I, I'm going to mention this because it's just such a useful resource. And I don't know if you've come across it, but the book by Gay Hendricks on called. Oh, the, yes. Big yeah. Leap. Mm-hmm. And he talks about the zone of incompetence, the zone of competence, the zone of excellence and the zone of genius. Genius. Yep. And for me, that ties in with the zone of incompetence. Don't touch it. Just hand it over. Abdicate it. You don't need to do it. Yes. Zone of genius. You want to hold on to that. That's what you want to do. And that's where your fulfillment and and mega growth is going to come from yes and the zone of excellence and competence you really want to know how to delegate powerfully in a way where you know what's going on enough and you are trusting people enough and giving them enough authority to actually have that independence to do that as well so Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm all about the zone of genius in 2021. <laughs> exactly. Me too. So tell me, what what is the shift that you've experienced in this conversation? I mean, this has been such a refreshing conversation. I, I think I needed to talk to you today just to remind myself that I am worthy of where I am and that I'm capable right where I am and that I'm um a good leader to my amazing team right where I am and that the mindset is that of expansion and that means that I'm not going to piddle in the little stuff, right? I'm not going to um, find myself contracting. I like our contraction and expansion example, just contracting my business. I want to expand it. And that means that there are things that I no longer need to do. And, and that's okay to catch myself. If I find myself wandering into that (laughs) arena, you know, exactly. Because we know that that survival instinct is a, it's a, it's a visceral body response. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, we can work with our rational brain that knows the direction of where we want to go. So yes. it's not, we know it's not about survival, even though sometimes it feels like it. It does feel yeah. like survival, but yeah. that's a scarcity mindset. Yeah. Speaking of yeah. another book, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. with the mindset, the growth mindset versus that. that. Yes, versus yeah. just that fixed mindset. And so I want that growth mindset. And that mm-hmm. does take revisiting and renewing your mindset, you yeah. know, as scenarios come up. So absolutely. And just to say the growth mindset book is, is called Mindset and mindset. It's by mm-hmm. Carol Dweck. So if anyone yes. wants to look it up. But that's been awesome. And for me also that contraction versus expansion. Do you want to keep yourself small, keep contracting, keep micromanaging? Or do you want to really expand and grow into that next level using your growth mindset, zone of genius, and everything that you want to create in the world? Absolutely. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for being here, Effie, and for being so open and sharing. It was just wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much. This wraps up another episode of Leadership Live. Thank you for joining us today. And now let's continue the conversation. Do you have any questions, comments, or suggestions? Connect with me on LinkedIn or head on to my website at daphnahorovitz.com where you can download a free sample of my new book, 
Weekly Habits for Extraordinary Leaders. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to share it with a friend so that I can continue to reach and support leaders just like you. So tune in next week to Leadership Live, where talented people become extraordinary leaders.